Hi, I'm Shannon Hogue. I am the Global Head of Solutions Engineering at Carrot. It's my job to make sure that every technical interview we conduct is aligned to the right job description and hiring bar, and to make sure those interviews are predictive, fair, and enjoyable. But as many of you probably experience, most technical interviews suck. Interviewers <laughs> use tired questions that don't produce a clear hiring signal and can insert bias and noise into the process. Prior to joining Carrot, I had years of experience on both sides of the technical interview. Unfortunately for anyone who previously interviewed with me, that usually meant counting the number of lowercase a's in a null terminated string. So if any of you are watching today, I'm sorry. <laughs> but the real reason my old interviews were unstructured, which is the word my PR guy told me to use instead of haphazard or lazy, uh, was that there was nobody at my old companies whose job it was to make interviews better. So I made it my job, and that's why I'm here today, to share some insight into what makes a technical interview good. And at Carrot, we call this process interview engineering. So why is this important? Well, if you think your team is good at conducting interviews, you're actually in the minority. In a recent survey we conducted with Harris Poll, 84% of C-level engineering leaders agreed that very few people at my company know how to conduct a technical interview. So clearly this is an engineering discipline that has been overlooked and needs to be optimized. But before we optimize, let's talk about what attributes make an interview fundamentally good. So first, it's predictive. It tells you how someone will perform on the job. Second, it's sensitive. It produces a distribution that allows you to make meaningful distinctions between candidates. Third, it's equitable. So two candidates of equal skill should expect equal results. And most importantly, fourth, it's objective. The criteria are unambiguous and there's no opportunity for the interviewer to fudge or introduce their own subjective bias into the scoring. In order to achieve this at Carrot, we think about it in six steps. The first step is job analysis and creating a list of relevant competencies. This means that for each job, someone needs to review the job description, the responsibilities, any existing assessments for the role to determine which competencies are necessary. For a typical engineering role, this could include basic coding, algorithms, or even talking through code. Having formal competency framework allows you to evaluate each competency intentionally. Don't try and measure multiple competencies at once and test your questions to make sure you're actually measuring what you think you are. Can your candidate speed read four paragraphs of English text? I'm serious, like an old colleague of mine had one interview where he was handed a four page packet and expected to read it, produce a spec and fully work in code at the end of the meeting. I'm not sure if that's how that team actually worked. He couldn't say because he didn't get the job, but it definitely didn't test his basic coding abilities. Now, does every candidate know the rules to the same board games as you? If not, does your question put someone at a disadvantage if you're asking them to recreate a game that they're not even familiar with? Now also be clear with the criteria and competencies that you're testing. If you wanna see a candidate test their code, ask them how they would test a piece of code, right? If you're expecting complete code or an outline, let them know. Is a brute force solution good enough or should the candidate start optimizing? Asking yourself these questions and being clear with your candidates will ensure that your interviews are predictive, fair, and at least from a structural standpoint, enjoyable. Now, once you've settled on what you're measuring, you can start to optimize your interview format and questions. So we'll talk about a couple of ways you can do that. Adding structure to your interview questions increases the signal that they produce while reducing potential bias of each question. A really common interview question format goes like this. Take a system like TinyURL or Uber and draw a diagram of it on the board. It's a cliche, but we still see it all of the time, right? The problem is that not all candidates understand the definitions of all the boxes and lines used in a typical whiteboard interview. These are examples of questions that a candidate from maybe MIT or Caltech may have learned, but someone from a code academy doesn't have the same context for, it, even if they understand system design. So making assumptions about what someone should have learned puts up barriers to entry, and it makes it harder to predict who actually has the right skill set. Our format for system design is to propose a simple, concrete system and ask the candidate to criticize aspects of its behavior. 
This sets clear expectations and narrows down the possible answers so it's easier to evaluate. It's also important to understand how your question progression can skew results. Here's an example of a seemingly ordinary multi-part question. As an introductory question, you ask a, ca a candidate to find the most common letter in a sentence. As a follow-up, you ask the most common letter in sentence A that does not appear in sentence B. Pretty simple. This slide shows two solutions with roughly equal merit. There's no compelling reason to choose one or the other. However, when it comes time for question two, the candidate who chose solution B has a head start over the one who chose solution A, and that's not equitable. The example may be contrived, but in practice we found that many multi-part questions exhibit surprising behaviors like this. So make sure you're using questions that are conceptually linked, but do not share implementation code. Now, once you've standardized on your questions and formats, the interviewers themselves are the biggest variable. You have very limited view into what actually happens once the door closes. So how can you ensure that your team's interviews are consistent? At Carrot, we have an advantage in answering this question because we have 70,000 recorded interviews that we can review and interrogate. So some tips, we put all of our interviews through quality control and we track any errors that an interviewer might make. By doing this, we found that a number of errors an interviewer makes decreases as they gain experience. Just like anything else, engineers get better at interviewing with practice, but too often interviewers are chosen based on who has free time and not necessarily based on experience. So if nothing else, this shows that what can be accomplished through mentoring and repetition is important. So train and review your interviewers. Now, candidate comfort is another important piece of good interviews. A comfortable candidate is more likely to show their true abilities, giving you the clearest hiring signal. One thing we found success with at Carrot is allowing candidates to redo their first interview. By learning the format and the expectations, and then trying again with a new interviewer in question, about a third of candidates substantially improved their performance. And interestingly enough, the redo is just as efficient as the first interview in producing hires. That is, each redo produces just as much of a chance of a hire as the first phone screen did, and that will make your recruiters very happy. Now that you've ensured the interview is being consistently administered, how do we bring consistency to the scoring system? Believe it or not, I've seen companies that have 40 possible grades between yes and no, where performance data had to be aggregated for every interviewer just to make a meaningful comparison, and that's just not a meaningful pattern. So if you take one thing away from today, please, 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 please use a structured scoring rubric, even if it's basic. The act of filling out a structured rubric will force your interviewers to validate their biases. And with a structured rubric, each evaluation is backed by rigorous definition that you can audit and defend. Now, once you've defined these scoring standards and they're collecting structured interview data, you can take a step back and ask yourself two questions. One, how does each interview perform in terms of producing a reliable hiring signal? And two, how does that hiring signal compare to your overall hiring bar? Much like an unstructured interview, roundtables, debriefs, and hiring committees can quickly devolve into a black box. If you aren't documenting your hiring decisions and standards, you'll never be able to audit your hiring processes. And if you're not analyzing your hiring decisions, you can't optimize the interviews. For instance, do you know what happened to the candidates who you rejected? If your rejected candidates are all getting snapped up by competitors, or even worse, companies you assumed had a higher hiring bar than you, you're probably optimizing interviews for the wrong things. There's very few areas of your business where you would ignore the value of structured data, but a scary number of companies I talk with can't answer basic questions about their hiring funnel, which makes it impossible to evolve your approach. In our recent survey, measurement was one of the biggest differentiators between leaders who are satisfied with their software engineers and ones who are less satisfied. But remember, bad data is just as bad as not having data at all. In fact, almost half of the ATS data that we audit has errors like this actual example of an incorrect projection input, which makes it look like your team rejected the candidate when in fact, 
the candidate may have rejected you. So having clean hiring data is critical because once you have a built-in structured interview process, you can optimize it to give your team a competitive hiring advantage. Now, finally, a few takeaways you can bring to your own hiring processes right away. So first, give interviewing an owner. By assigning an engineer to optimize each part of the interview, you create accountability for the consistency of that section. Second, centralize interviewing and training. Inconsistent interviewers are a danger to your business. Don't just train on general guidelines of interviewing. Train interviewers on specific questions they will ask and make consistent standards. Third, find a way to audit your interviews. Even if you can't record interviews as we do, use shadows, analyze metadata, and give feedback to non-predictive interviewers or those who don't follow a structure. Also, make sure to audit your team's questions and throw away the bad ones. And finally, build your process for data collection from day one. If you build structure into the process from the ground floor, you'll be able to optimize, react quickly, and reduce the time you waste on unproductive interviews and on interviewing the wrong candidates. Thank you so much.